know you gotta make that green stuff right. And if you can't make it... Lot of multimedia. We're live. All right. Um, thank you, Aaron, for all these neat graphics. Uh, this is the Permissionless Software Foundation's Technical Steering Committee. It is June 9th, uh, 2021. And the purpose of this meeting is just to cover the, the technical aspects uh, and accomplishments that we've achieved over the last couple weeks. Let's get started with a, a round of uh, introductions. I'll start. My name is Chris Troutner. Uh, I, I helped found the PS Foundation, uh, the Permissionless Software Foundation, with, uh, with a few people, and I also manage fullstack.cash. Stoyan, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Stoyan Zhekov, and I'm helping with uh, development of the JavaScript libraries for PCF, like PCH, GS, etc. It's all for me. Right on. Uh, Daniel couldn't make it today. Uh, Aaron, I know you don't have a feed, but you, uh, you're, you're lurking in the background. You want to just give a, a brief yeah, introduction? Yeah. Uh, my name's Aaron Shoemaker. Let me pop myself up real quick. Uh, wrong one. My name's Aaron Shoemaker. I'm kind of running the uh, producer role today as we're doing the talk, and I'll be talking as well. So we're just trying to up our game here at the PSF. So. That's looking pretty good. Very, very professional. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and uh, show the agenda. Oh, that's Telegram. There we go. Uh, this is the agenda for today. Um, as always, you can find the agenda in the Permissionless Software Foundation GitHub group in the TSC. That stands for Technical Steering Committee repository, and then we file the agendas as issues. Um, so all the old agendas are there. Uh, they're just, the issue's been closed, so they're archived, but everything's there. And um, so in our current stage of growth, these meetings are really all about celebrating the accomplishments that we've achieved uh, in between the meetings. We have these meetings every two weeks. As we grow, we will eventually uh, spin off work groups for, uh, for, for specific things like NFT tokens or uh, front end wallets or, um, you know, coin join uh, protocols, things like that. And then, and then these meetings will become an opportunity for those work groups to report in, but we're not there yet. Uh, and so let's take a look at what we've accomplished in the last couple of weeks as an organization. So I'll start with the PSF core software. And uh, there's a link here if anybody wants to understand more deeply what, what I mean by PSF core software, but, but roughly it's the cache stack. It's the BCH API, REST API, BCHJS JavaScript library, and the Gatsby IPFS web wallet, which is a front end web wallet, um, which people can access at wallet.fullstack.cache. Uh, on fullstack.cache, we added a new section called what type of developer are you? And it sort of breaks in the three different specialties. These, these apply generally to all languages, but they, they're particularly applicable to, to JavaScript. Uh, a lot of people start with front end and then they work into the back end, but the back end is really its own specialty. They typically separate, and then there's there's libraries like npm libraries, and that's that's a bit of a specialty on its own. So the content in these sections are relatively um, there's there's not a lot there yet. I'm going to be adding more content over the next couple of weeks, but the intent of these new sections is for developers to quickly um, find the tools that are of most interest to them. Uh, and, and, and come up to speed on them. So if you're a front-end developer, you can go to the front-end section. It's going to very quickly help you uh, set up a fork, forkwallet.fullstack.cache and start customizing it for your own uh, app. And if you're a back-end developer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to walk you through you know, the, the cache stack, how to set up full nodes and indexers, how to run some of the command line uh, uh, 
apps uh, for, for, for sending uh, transactions using the different blockchains. And then if you're a library developer, uh, that, that section is going to cover a lot of the middleware libraries that we've developed, um, as well as testing practices uh, and, um, and just, just uh, best practices for, for, for library developers and, and sort of our, our approach to it in fullstack.cash. Let's see, going back. And uh, Aaron, Stoyan, if you guys have any comments, feel free to, to uh, break in at any time. Um, uh, I, I encourage you to interrupt me. <laughs> okay. Sounds good to uh, me. Uh, right on. I, I like, I'm liking what I'm seeing with everything. You know, it's, uh, it's exciting to see. And here, I'll break in so people can see me now. Uh, yeah, I'm... I like the idea of the front end, the back end, the library. This is something we're talking about with this uh, development program. And we're, we are interested in people that want to learn crypto and learn and program it. So uh, if you have some HTML knowledge, some CSS knowledge, and some JavaScript knowledge, please get in touch with us because we'd like to talk with you. And uh, we're going to be... Uh, developing this program over the coming months and hope to launch it sometime in the fall is is my hope i don't know about you chris yeah that's i'd love i think i think all the dominoes are set up we just need or we need to put a few more dominoes in place and then yeah i think yeah. around the fall we can let them fall <laughs> and we we do want to let you know if uh you guys do feel like donating to us there is a donation address that will go to uh burn some slp tokens that will help out the SLP token. And I think uh, token liquidity is something we're talking about next. So, Yeah, yeah, we'll be getting there. Um, real quick, uh, let me just expand on some of these, uh, some of these pages. And, um, oh, there we go. Chew and ice in the microphone. Okay, That's a rookie sorry, mistake. No, sorry about that. I'm having a little trouble with my my Zoom controls here. Uh, there we go. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. I keep accidentally muting myself. The front end page has a YouTube video that shows how to very quickly. Uh, fork wallet.fullstack.cash and start building your own apps. And I'm planning to create another video to complement this one specifically on our plugin architecture. Uh, the, the approach that we take with the front end wallet is anything that can be a plugin should be a plugin. It's very modular, uh, like Lego blocks. And so right now, the basic information is there to get started with this. And we're going to, I'm going to be fleshing this out with additional sort of live demos to demonstrate some of the apps that have already been built with this technology. And, uh, and then there will be another section for plugins. And then we'll eventually have uh, sort of like a, I'm not sure what the word would be, but like a, like a trophy or a, um, an expose area where people can show off their plugins and their, their, their web apps that they built, build using this, this tech. The, um, the backend area focuses on that lower half of the cash stack, uh, as well as some of the more command line based uh, applications. And so it goes into a lot of that, that sort of what would be considered core infrastructure for, for building a, building a, um, an app, a cryptocurrency app. And then finally, the, the JavaScript library uh, focuses, uh, or the library section focuses on that, that middleware, which is typically JavaScript uh, in this paradigm, and, uh, and just cover some of the, the most important libraries. Right now, it calls out SLP Cli Wallet. The next library I'm going to get up there is Avex Cli Wallet. So it's the same exact interface, but one is on the Avalanche blockchain, one's on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. And uh, we have a series of other libraries, one of which I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, like for calculating merit scores and doing end-to-end -end encryption. So anyways, that's, uh, 
that is what's new on fullstack.cache. So I really would love to get some feedback from people in the, the permissionless software telegram channel. Uh, if you notice any typos or bugs or have suggestions, I'm all ears for this sort of stuff. And uh, like I said, I'll be, be adding additional content in the next few weeks. Um, and, go ahead. And that's at uh, chat.fullstack.cash. You can see that down below. Or, sorry, fullstack.cache. I'm off today. Uh, so we're going to get to chat.fullstack.cache in a little bit. So, But if you guys look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the web address. Uh, check it out. Please do get in touch with us. Uh, we really are interested in working with people in the community and developing these products. Nice. Yeah. So next on the agenda is this, um, it's worth mentioning, there's been several upgrades to the token liquidity app. Uh, we use the token liquidity app to maintain liquidity between the PSF token and Bitcoin Cash. And what we're preparing to do is launch the token liquidity app on the eCash blockchain, as well as the Avalanche blockchain. Uh, and we're going to do this shortly after we launch our token bridge. So the idea is that you have one PSF token that you can transfer across blockchains and then exchange for the reserve currency on that blockchain. So, so you, you'll have, you could take your PSF tokens from the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, transfer them to the Avalanche blockchain, and then exchange them for Avalanche. Uh, and then and also reverse the entire process. Um, so the, we're not there yet, but the, the accomplishments we've achieved in the last couple of weeks is just better debugging and email alerts. We now have it set up where uh, anyone who wants to set up a token liquidity app for their own token, uh, everything you need to customize the, the app is in one file. It's a, a, a .env file, a .env file, which lets you set all the environment variables to customize the app for your token. So if people are interested in launching the token liquidity app, I encourage you to play with it, check out that M file. And it's also now lets you set up email alerts because um, we live in a messy world and things, you know, we have hiccups like the network goes down briefly or you hit rate limits or, you know, take your pick. When the token liquidity app runs into those kinds of issues, it will uh, attempt to recover, but it will now also send, you can put like a, one or an array of email addresses for it to notify like administrators like hey i'm running into trouble here and and you should probably take a look at me so it's like a cry for help kind of thing so we're pretty excited about that um feature and uh, especially we're getting a lot more usage of the token liquidity app so it's 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 critical that it's uptime uh and uh is as high as possible and it, its ability to recover from these sort of everyday, you know, type of network issues is as robust as possible. Awesome. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is the Fulcrum API. So this is um, this speaks again directly to the core uh, PSF software. And if I bring up Fullstack.cache, you'll see that there is this. Uh, the cache stack and um, one of this Electrum X block is the the fulcrum indexer. That's what provides address balances and UTXO information for an address. Those are like the two critical pieces of information that the indexer provides that the full node does not provide and is required to do any sort of wallet functionality. And when this was originally developed uh, for Fulcrum, uh, it has this sort of really weird way that it's networked. And as fullstack.cache increases its um, uh, the, the volume, the, the quantity of, of API calls per day, as it increases, we need to scale horizontally. And we ran into an issue with scaling horizontally with the existing Fulcrum Docker container the way it was built. So this is just some tweaks, and uh, this is actually a really good segue into the next the next uh, agenda item here. And we have created a new V5 route. V4 is the standard route that BCHJS uses and that everybody should be using right now because it's the only functional route. 
we created a new V5 route. And in the next week or two, we will start to transition BCHJS to this new V5 route. And there's two big changes to the V5 route. Um, the first one is replacing the old fulcrum calls with the new fulcrum calls to fulcrum API. So um, before, again, going, it helps to look at this cache stack. The REST API would call and talk to the fulcrum indexer directly. Now what happens is the fulcrum indexer is in its own Docker container and it's uh, orchestrated with a second Docker con container that is a dedicated API. And so by that, that was the missing piece is by combining a REST API with the fulcrum indexer together in one package, we can now scale that horizontally. And, um, and it also uh, fixes a few networking issues that we were having with the there's a, there we go with a BCH API. So so it's 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 kind of a minor tweak. If you're using BCHJS, you won't even know notice that anything changed. It's only if you're running BCH API is sort of a little tweak, and it 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 did require a a version change to the route and. Um, the other big feature that we're adding is the double spend proof. Uh, so this is a new feature on the BCHN full nodes. Um, there's a couple other full nodes that support it as well, but uh, we mostly focus on whatever full node the miners run, which is BCHN. And uh, this allows you to um, essentially, if someone tries to double spend, which is a, let, let's take a minute to talk about double spending here. Uh, double spending is a very difficult thing to do. The full nodes have uh, a natural ability to prevent uh, double spends because because new developers especially do it on accident all the time. If you if you try to spend a UTXO and then and then rapidly spend another UTXO, uh, a lot of times that that UTXO information, like I said, is coming from the indexer, and so it takes time, like three seconds for the first you for the transaction to propagate around the network and for the indexer to update its state to the new utxo and so new developers i see this happen all the time with new developers where they'll rapidly try and spend uh transactions and uh they won't give enough time they won't give that extra like two seconds or three seconds for the indexer to update its state and they'll end up act what it generates a, an accidental double spend. And what the full node will do is the full node knows what UTXOs are valid and which ones aren't. So it'll naturally throw an error when that happens. And so doing a double spend is not something that you can do um, easily, but if you're a malicious user and you have access to two nodes, you can do a double spend because then you can bypass that natural protection in the full node and send the same, or try and spend the same UTXO in two separate transactions through two different full nodes, and um, so that's the that you know that, and that's like a clearly malicious uh, intent, and it, it happens. And so these double spend proofs, basically, uh, as as rare they are, as rare as they are, in order, this is a step in the direction of making secure zero conf transactions. And so when a full node detects a double spend, it will generate uh, a, a, a double spend proof. And this is the new feature that just went into the, the, full, the BCHN full node uh, a, a few months ago. And uh, there, there are no libraries that I'm aware of that, that leverage this new RPC call. Um, so this is, we're gonna be breaking new ground here with BCHJS uh, probably next week when we, when we launch this. And, uh, and it is live in BCH API right now. Uh, if you want to just interact with it directly. But uh, so if, if you can manage to generate a double spend, and I have a script that I can share with people if they want to play with this, um, you, you have to have two, like you can use a locally running copy of BCH API and then use the full stack.cache API in order to spend, you know, like I said, you have to, uh, it's a little tricky to spend, but I have a script that I can share to let people deliberately generate double spends. And uh, what you'll see is uh, one of them, will return a value at, from this RPC call, which is the proof saying like, this is not a valid transaction. This, this is the double spend. It, like the full node will decide which one is legitimate and which one is not legitimate. And so the use case here 
So that I probably should have started with the use case rather than going right into the technical things. So the, the canonical use case here is you go to buy a coffee, or though you know probably more more something more expensive because double spend proofs are, or double spending is not very easy to pull off. But uh, or actually, I think a good example is the token liquidity app. Right now, the token liquidity app waits uh, one or two confirmations depending on the situation uh, before it will send the 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 tokens. And so if we incorporate this double spend proof, we can return the tokens um, after about five seconds uh, where we, the, the app would see the Bitcoin cash come in and then it would wait five seconds and then it would uh, query the, the full node to see if, uh, if this transaction triggered a double spend proof. And if it did not, it can, it's pretty safe at that point. It's about 99% confidence that it's not a double spend and it can be processed right away and that it, it will get confirmed into a block. Uh, and then if, the, if it does trigger a double spend proof, well, then the app can safely ignore it, possibly blacklist uh, that address. But that's the idea is it's, it's about, it's like, you know, if you, if you ask anybody, they'll tell you maybe, you know, somewhere between three and five seconds, but just to be safe, I'm gonna call, call it five seconds. Uh, but within about five seconds, there was some, some uh, research done by Peter Risen on how, how probable is it for a double spend to get uh, confirmed in a block. And it, after about five seconds, the, uh, the transaction is propagated around the world across the full network. And so a, a, a double spend after that is probably not going to succeed. And so anyways, that's the idea. Um, I, I don't know if this is like the silver bullet to make a uh, secure zero comp. There's a lot of doubt about that, but this is a new feature. It will probably work 90% of the time or more, probably more than 90, but it'll probably cover 90% of the use cases. So it's definitely something that uh, I'm, I'm excited to support and uh, I'm excited to see, you know, you know, we just need to start playing with it and, uh, and sort of if there is a security issue with these, we need to just start exploring that and we need to see, we need to sort of open the door in little ways to malicious actors to try and really put this to the test. That's just sort of where the network is at right now. Uh, so um, we're going to see. So, so it's, a, it's a big warning. Like this is cool tech. It's also brand new. Uh, no, everyone should not start doing zero comp, assuming that this is secure. But if you're a developer, this is an excellent time to start playing with this endpoint and, and this new tech. You heard them, people. All you hackers and malicious out actors out there, come on down and play with our tech and see if you can break it. And uh, so, what you're talking about here is getting us closer to that uh, that that goal of zero confirmation, mm -hmm. essentially, and which would help because I mean, you're a retailer. Say you run things wrong. You know, you could double spend somebody's coins. That wouldn't necessarily be a malicious thing, but you, I could see retailers firing that off really quickly. I've I've had people run my cards twice in in less than that time, and you know that that would help to not be able to do that, yeah. and it would help to secure against malicious actors as well. So this is pretty cool tech, Chris. Thanks, man. Yeah, I'm excited to see how it plays out. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic. It, uh, you know, in the case of like a, buying a coffee, you, you're not like you're, you're really just doing one transaction and, uh, you know, someone's not going to exploit that. I think that's like a perfect application for this technology. Uh, in the oh, case yeah. of the token liquidity app, you know, that's more of an automated app. So if someone found an exploit, they could just be sitting there running the exploit and and we wouldn't really know unless we you know got an email from the app or, or checked on it and so that's why i'm a little i'm probably not going to implement this right away uh in into something like the token liquidity app so people have to be really careful about the use case yeah totally so we welcome anybody to come and work on this stuff once again uh our doors are open we want to talk to you so Give us a call. Hit us up on Telegram. Stoyan, you got any words on this? No, I, I would try, definitely. So, awesome. yeah, waiting with big impatience to have something to try. 
Yeah, and like I said, anybody who wants to deliberately generate a double spend, I have I have a script that you, that you can run to do that, um, so that you can you can try out this new endpoint and just sort of see the kind of uh, output that it gives you um, when when it does detect the double spend. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to try that out. So, you know, uh, send it my way. i pr- I might be able to try it out this weekend at some point. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll drop the link in the uh, permissionless software foundation Telegram channel. Right on, right on. Uh, what's so? What's next on the agenda here? Yeah, so that's that wraps up the core software updates. Um, the JSON RPC over IPFS and the pay to write database. These are um, some ongoing areas of research that that I've been engaged in, uh, along with uh, with Daniel, uh, who couldn't make it today. Um, this is actually up on chat.fullstack.cache if anybody wants to play with it. And what it is, is um, it's a peer-to-peer database. And, and right now there's only one of them. I, I just discovered a bug today. I was trying to replicate the data, but the whole idea behind it is it's supposed to be peer-to-peer. So like a blockchain, everyone can, ma- can run their own instance of the database. And, uh, and in order to write to the database, you have to submit a proof of burn. Um, so you, you burn a token. And, and the other update on this is that uh, it now works with PSF tokens. So in order to be allowed to write up to 10 kilobytes of data to the database, you have to burn uh, 0.01 PSF tokens and, uh, and then submit the transaction ID for that burn, for that trans- burn transaction. And that's your ticket to be allowed to write to the database. Um, and every instance of the database will, will independently verify that burn by, by going to the blockchain and, and verifying that it's a legitimate transaction. And so I'm really excited about this tech because it's it's got very similar qualities to a blockchain, but there's no um, uh, mining involved. And it's uh, any community can essentially rapidly set up a database and this also solves what I see to be a very long-term problem with uh, blockchains in general, but particularly Bitcoin Cash, in that there's this tension between data and cash use cases. And so this is a way to get the data off the chain and optimize exclusively for the cash use case. Uh, so it, this is a problem way down the line, and not everybody agrees with me that this is a problem, but... Uh, I'm excited to see all the different, you know, types of use cases that, 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 this, that this opens up. So if anybody who wants to play with it, it is up on chat.fullstack.cache. Um, I have a link here to the JSON RPC documentation. So just to give a quick um, show of, if you go to chat.fullstack.cache, give it a few minutes, you'll see um, the P2W uh, DB entry come up and then you can click on it and start a private chat with it, and you can send it a couple of these really simple JSON RPC commands. So just copy and paste that into the chat, and that will instruct the app to tell you about itself. And then you can also do this read all, just uh, copy and paste, and and the app will, will do a data dump and, and display all the data that's in the database. It's, it's only like two or three entries right now. Um, so it's it's at a place where people can very tentatively start dipping their toe in the water and playing with it. And uh, and like I said, there is a bug right now. If you try to uh, replicate, it won't replicate properly, or at least there's there's something weird going on there. Um, there's that always I'm trying a to bug. Dig into. There's yeah. always yeah, a this, bug. This is research. It's all ongoing research. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell me this. I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about this uh, this data problem with the blockchain because uh, I'm I'm seeing the same things as you. You know, there's this mm-hmm. concern about writing data to the blockchain, and I do like this idea of uh, pay to write. You can run your own database, that sort of thing. Uh, so one of my questions is definitely, um, I'm well, if you could expand upon a little bit the problem with writing data to the blockchain and two um this idea of pay to write databases could this help lead towards stuff things like uh decentralized vpns 
Um, decentralized VPNs is definitely a possibility. Um, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the pay to write database. Um, one of the things the this pay to write database rides on top of the the JSON RPC over IPFS. Yeah, and that technology. Um, that can enable decentralized VPNs that could, that could allow your computer to talk to a VPN service and on the fly negotiate the VPN service um, <clears throat> and pay for it. And, uh, and you'd be able to do that with any computer in the world. Uh, and, and it would eliminate all the sort of networking headache that is typically associated with that. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that's, so, so there's there's two technologies here. There's the JSON RPC over IPFS, which is a, a replacement for the REST API mm -hmm. and overcomes a lot of the, the censorship issues that a REST API um, could be blocked by. Uh, and then there's this pay to write database, which is really uh, just a solution to this data problem, uh, the on-chain data problem, getting data off-chain. Well, I, uh, I see uh, other things for the pay to write. Say, uh, okay. Say I'm a manufacturing company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big push for manufacturing companies to move to VPNs. The problem being uh, a lot of the networking they would use or the cloud services are run by big companies like Amazon and Google. Now, if I am a uh, big, uh, I have intellectual property and I'm this uh, manufacturing company and, you know, I make widgets, you know, classic ex economics example, and I've got a trade secret on the widgets and stuff like that. I'm a little hesitant to utilize VPNs because I don't know if Amazon or Google are going to come and take some of that information, even if they say they're not. Uh, the other thing where I see the pay to write working in industries like that is um, my employees can't just go and change stuff all, all the time. And if they do change stuff, I have a good track record because what you're saying is I could set up a database as a manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. I could create my own tokens that work within my company. And in order to write to the database, my employees would have to burn those tokens, giving both a, a record of who did it, when it was done, and then I know that it's securely written to my database. Then combining that with this JSON over RPC to create these virtual private networks, we could create huge, fast databases where we don't have to have the warehouses of servers or uh, the tech headaches that come today. So that's those are two problems in industries like manufacturing industries where you have uh, trade secrets or in, or intellectual property where I could mm -hmm. see this solving because uh, I, I, uh, if I'm them, I'm going, I'm not so sure I want to use uh, Amazon. Who's, mm -hmm. who's to say that somebody in Amazon, this is a big company. I'm not saying everybody's bad in Amazon, but who's to say mm -hmm. a malicious actor in Amazon isn't going to hack into my VPN and steal information that's valuable to my company and sell it to my competitors. Right. And being able to, yeah, one, that's a good tee up. Yeah, go ahead. That's a good tee up for some of, for some of the problems that it solves. Cause it, what this solves is a bunch of small problems, but when you add them all up, they become a big problem. And so there's a lot of interest right now uh, around um, using the blockchain to record data. And, and people are starting to wise up that like, okay, well, clearly it's, it, it's starting to become just well accepted that, that putting the, the actual content on the blockchain is a bad idea. But what we can do is encrypt the data, upload it to IPFS, and then just write the hash to the, to the blockchain. That's a much more efficient way to do the same yeah. thing. And, uh, and so people are starting to, to get up on that. But even if that was to achieve mass adoption, even that efficient way of doing it would, would still like incredibly bloat the, the size of the blockchain. And that's not necessarily a problem to some people um, because, because it's just the size of the blockchain. It doesn't affect the actual like uh, transaction capability. Once, once you get a full node, uh, synced and, and, and people think like, oh, I can buy a hundred dollar 
you know, hard drive, four terabyte hard drive from Amazon. And like, what's the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, well, well, the problem, there's a couple problems. Uh, the first problem is the IBD or initial block download when you sync uh, a full node and bring it to the network for the first time. You have to download and process all the data that's ever been put on the blockchain ever. And, uh, and this is, that's the big re it's, it's not the amount of storage space it takes on the hard drive. That's the problem. It's the amount of time it takes a full node to sync up to the current tip of the chain. Um, that but that's is just like 15 minutes, right, Chris, that's just yeah, like right. 15 minutes. Yeah. Now, yeah. Get, I mean, give us I've, an idea about how long it takes right now. You know, I have, I have my own solution, so I haven't had to do it in a long time. And it also is greatly dependent on your hardware and your uh, and your network speed. So if you have like a fiber optic connection with the top of the line and hardware, it might only take two or three days. Um, uh, but if you're a normal person on a normal home internet connection with a normal laptop, it's probably going to take you two or three weeks. That's two to three days for top of the line, people. Two to three days. And so... Mm -hmm. We are looking at solutions, and you have a you have a solution. You mentioned it. Uh, what's your solution that you have right now, Chris? Yes, yeah, so we have the cash strap page on Fullstack. So it's fullstack.cash slash cash strap, and it's a play on the word bootstrap. And so what they are is instead of uh, it's it's a it's a sort of like a trusted uh, setup where instead of the untrusted setup where you start from Genesis and you uh, you sync from Genesis, you can actually download from the cash strap page over IPFS, a pre-synced uh, blockchain. And so then you just have to sync from whenever that snapshot was to the head, but it, it's still 150 gigabyte download. So uh, you have to download it, you have to unzip it uh, and then mount it with the Docker container and then sync from where that snapshot was. So it reduces that time down to two or three hours uh, depending on your hardware. Uh, but you know, that that's, and, and that's might be okay. Uh, you know, in, in the case of full stack.cash we're, we're spinning up and spinning down infrastructure for people. So that's actually an onerous amount of time, uh, to be able to do that. Look, I'm running a Chromebook with a dial up connection here. It'll take me no time. All right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You're right. Exactly. Okay. So, can I just say also on, on the topic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, the problems that Aaron was talking about uh, and uh, these uh, tools uh, are a little hard to see. Uh, not exactly about the, the privacy and, and encryption, because how to see the, the problem that you have with Amazon, you can make end-to-end uh, -end encryp encryption. But mm -hmm. this is not the point of this uh, JSON RPCs. It's more about the uh, to not have a central point. So mm -hmm. yeah. if uh, how to see, you don't go to the big company, you can use thousands of small companies which providing similar services, go from how to see do through any of them and do the same job. Mm -hmm. well, and yeah. about yeah. the pay to this data, uh, keeping data off chain, we see keeping data on chain. We, we was talking about this from a long time and imagine you can a uh, huge like uh, brick, not brick, uh, like panel, concrete panel, and you need to transport it from uh, the, the factory to your house. So one way is to make it extremely fast. So you destroy it on small pieces and start going uh, with your Porsche, mm -hmm. <laughs> going to your house, and start to combine it again to become a panel. Mm -hmm. Or you can get a truck. So <laughs> The people trying how to see to to put uh, small pieces of uh, data inside like many 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 transactions just to save them on chain, mm -hmm. which is well okay but not so good solution, mm -hmm. and then can be something off chain like this example this mm -hmm. for example pay to write database IPFS anything 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 where you can keep all of your data in secure way, like secure mean, mm -hmm. uh, unchangeable, mutable, what else? So it's mm -hmm. more about uh, this kind of stuff than more about the encrypted connections or privacy yeah. or stuff like this one. 
I love yeah, yeah. I love that and, you know, we, analogy. I love that analogy, Stoyan. That is Bre a good analogy. Breaking it apart into little pieces. I love that you're taking a Porsche though. Yeah. <laughs> With all your cement pieces. Yeah, yeah, because you want it fast, right? <laughs> You're going to get it cement all over your leather, though. you going to scratch up yeah. the leather. But, I mean, it will be fast, right? But yeah. it will be like, really? You will do this one? But the yeah. people really trying to do this with the data on the blockchain. We were talking about uh, putting the, how to see, the huge images on the blockchain. So, well, they will destroy the image on the small op return 200 by transaction, put them on chain. And after this, they will need to, again, make the whole picture from this stuff. Yeah, so all, these, all I, these little pieces. Yeah. And I know that the people who are like, uh, want to, to make a fast payments, they're pissed off from this one. Really? I will uh, just need to pass uh, two gigabytes of transactions with uh, like images just... So my like payment uh, transaction can go. Mm. Yeah. It's like yeah. Very long going so, discussion. And I think yeah, it will continue maybe until we find some good solutions. So there's there's a half a dozen little um, little infrastructural issues that I think that this this architecture um, solves. But I'm I think the 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 new applications that it opens are, are much sexier. Um, so just to, just to talk about those for a minute. Um, How sexy. One of the, oh yeah, well, get ready. Uh, one of the ways I, I hope to see this database used in the future as, is as a cross-blockchain communication medium and a cross-blockchain uh, token medium. So I... Uh, Right now, the proof of burn is a TXID on the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. But what I plan to do in the future, once we get the actual database part, you know, working really well, is create interfaces for other blockchains. So you can, we'll have, we already have plans to have the PSF token on the Bitcoin Cash, eCash, and Avalanche blockchains, and probably the Lotus blockchain too. Um, and so you'll be able to burn a PSF token to, as proof of burn on any of those blockchains to write to the one peer-to-peer -peer database. And so what that lets you do is you can, you can uh, burn a token on one chain to upload some content and then uh, read that content from any other chain, on-chain, uh, and, and upload data from the other chain. So it will allow blockchains to communicate across chain. And I've, I've actually had a short conversation with Andrew Stone from BU about how this could be used to set up oracles, um, the cross chain oracles. And so Very that's, cool. that's a mind blow right there. But, yeah. but, uh, but before we go too deep into those weeds, the other application that I, I'm hoping to, to see on this is um, I'd like to port the SLP token specification to the database uh, so that the, the tokens, rather than being on a blockchain, actually live in the database. So then you'll have a cross blockchain uh, token standard. Um, so it doesn't matter which blockchain you're on, you're gonna be interacting with the same token. Uh, and that would, um, that would essentially let businesses create their own token and then, and then they just don't even have to think about the blockchain. They don't even have to think about which blockchain they're on. Uh, you know, they'll just use whichever one is the most convenient th at that moment. And if there's a problem with that blockchain, they'll have other blockchains and they can just seamlessly switch over to these other blockchains. Dude, you told me it was sexy. You did not tell me it was 91 Pamela Anderson sexy. <laughs> That's well, we are awesome. geeks, so it's <laughs> <laughs> dude. That is pretty cool. Uh, and so, being able to move between blockchains for uh, people that don't know about this, which if you're watching this, I don't know why you don't know. But if you don't know, this is a great, great thing that we've been trying to work on in the space for a long time. And I like the idea that it can be used as an oracle. That's that's awesome. And uh, people can write to it from many different chains. I mean, the applications are going to be huge in this sort of thing. So it's yeah. exciting. And, you know, th those are the those are the sort of tech 
techno, you know, intense stuff, but you know, more simpler use cases is just uncensorable Craigslist, you know, like, yeah. like, like you can't, it's the reason why Craigslist doesn't exist on the blockchain is because it's hard to put all that data on the blockchain, but something like this makes that use case much more practical. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Stoyan, you got thoughts on it? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Well, we, we talked, I think, about this, the previous uh, technical meeting also, about mm -hmm. the everybody's, it's pretty hot topic now, uh, like uh, storage for NFTs, for example. Everybody wants to have uh, media stored somewhere. So everybody's like uh, racing now to, to, to make something good. So I think it will be very used service. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, yeah. So it's worth talking about that storage thing. So um, this is still an evolving idea, but, but one advantage that this peer to peer database has over a standard blockchain is that it can be backed up to Filecoin um, because it's on the IPFS network. So rather than having one database that continually grows year after year, um, I haven't had a chance to really fully explore this idea, but but I'm leaning towards we would sunset the 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 database every year. Um, so probably like in uh, when does Q3 start? Like it's December, November, October. So probably like October 1st, we'd start the next year's blockchain, and it would kind of overlap the previous year's blockchain. And then on January, we'd sunset the old blockchain, back it up to Filecoin. Anybody who wants to like access an archival copy that could be like a separate paid service, but uh, but that would uh, keep the blockchain from from growing too big in any one calendar year um, to be onerous to have, you know that, that would the smaller we can make it the the better that is for decentralization and censorship resistance. Uh, but we have the ability at any point in time. Anyone has the ability at any point in time to uh, push the database onto the file coin and back it up. And uh, so that's a, that's a, that's a feature that the blockchains don't have. It will be interesting uh, to do, like I think the R drive guys, uh, what is they doing is uh, depends from how much uh, tokens you burn, it will depends how long it will keep uh, your information. So now you're talking to, like uh, Sunsetic every year, but it will be interesting, for example, there is the people who are interested in their data to be there for a month, for example, for mm -hmm. some hackathon or something. They don't want to pay much, but other guys, they want to be there for 100 years. So, yeah, just if they pay more, they will be there more. Yeah, so I'm really excited. More flexible, that. how to see, to not have a scheduled uh, like uh, backup, but uh, depends from the bony tokens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good idea that's a good idea i mean i'm excited to get to the point where we can explore that more fully um and get get a better idea of like what the costs are because i have a feeling that um yeah i mean just the costs around this are totally different than it would be for a blockchain and uh, it, uh right now just because i had to pick a number i picked ten thousand uh, bytes or 10 kilobytes and 0.01 PSF tokens. I have no idea if those are the right numbers. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll discover what the right number is as we as we move along. But uh, yeah, yeah, I like the idea of, of time-based payments, like kind of like Filecoin does it. You know, Stoyan, you uh, inspire me to think of the Queen song, Who Wants Their Data Forever? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because how to see. Horrible like, dad uh, joke. If you know the... The Volvo commercials, your car will leave even if you die. So it can be the same. Your data will be leave there forever. So, yeah, yeah just pay us enough to keep it. <laughs> God. I'm sorry for the horrible dad joke there. I just uh, had to make it. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, next. Yeah, there's just a couple more things on the agenda here. <clears throat> yes. Um, the merit calculation is worth mentioning. I have a link to the pull request for anybody who wants to check into it, but, uh, one of our members discovered, uh, I don't know if it's a bug is the right word, but, but, uh, an undesirable way that merit was being calculated when 
Uh, and it happened when he moved from Electron Cash Wallet into message.fullstack.cash. So the merit calculation, mm. which is very important because your merit is is what governs. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Little bug. <laughs> no worries. The, the merit calculation is what essentially determines how much influence you have on the governance of, of the PSF. And uh, so that's why people who take the governance a little more seriously are concerned about how the merit is calculated. Um, I'd love to get more feedback on this because it, 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 as I dug into it, it seemed like there was a lot of different ways to do it. Essentially, so the, the idea behind the merit is it's a very simple idea. You take the quantity of tokens multiplied by the age of the tokens in days and that's that's your merit score um however if you say pay someone in psf tokens that's going to reset the clock to zero and that's undesirable we want to be able to have people sort of simultaneously stake stake tokens and be able to spend tokens um as long as they're sort of spending and replacing and uh so what it does instead is it it follows the parent UTXOs to the oldest one it can find uh, that originated from the same address. So as long as the, the tokens uh, stayed in that address or are from that address, they got spent but returned back to that address, that's how we're sort of count, calculating the age is it's based on the oldest parent from that address. Now, the problem arose when you had multiple token UTXOs that got combined into one and uh, there's an example of a, of a transaction here I can actually show on the screen. Um, I don't know if people can see that right now, Aaron. Let me, uh, uh, let me take you guys off because I... Uh, give me one second. What is this spinning stuff on the Explorer from, from some days? It's you know, like the Explorer's not in a healthy place right now the bitcoin.com explorer i'm actually like really thinking about whether or not we should build our own token explorer uh just because it seems like a lot of support um is is going away uh for slp tokens or it, it, the you know the, the ones that everybody's used bitcoin.com and simple ledger are, are, are starting to cut back uh, so it might be a good idea for us to build our own block explorer yeah. But anyways, this is an example of the transaction I'm talking about where on the left you have uh, three token inputs being merged into a single transaction. So in this transaction, you had three token UTXOs being merged. Um, and so the question is, which, which UTXO parent chain do you follow? And uh, so the, the code tweak I made is it, well, it follows the oldest one. It'll It'll look at each one and figure out which one is the oldest and then follow that chain of parents. And um, I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I've tried to think through so, like the, the sort of um, attack vectors here. And I'm, I'm a little worried I might not have thought of everything. But uh, if, if anyone is inclined to uh, follow this link to the pull request and look at the code and how I calculated it, and I left some notes in there, I'd love, I'd love feedback and I'd love to hash this out. Um, and I have a feeling like this is something that's going to come back to haunt us in the future in terms of different ways this could be done and different attacks, particularly as this organization grows and, and the, the people are more and more concerned with how the merits calculated. I'm, I have a feeling this is going to come back to haunt us. So if, if we can address this sooner rather than later, that would be great. Um, but, uh, uh, so if, so if anybody wants to look at that and feed and give me feedback, I would be incredibly appreciative. Uh, and, um, like I said, there's, there's multiple ways to do it and the potential attack vectors, uh, are really what determine the right way to do it. Uh, and so I think, I think I've tried to, s to hit on the simplest, most effective way to do it, uh, while minimizing attack vectors. But if somebody thinks of something that they don't think I've thought of, or has a suggestion on a different way to do the calculation. Um, you know, some of these calculations can be incredibly complex or they can be incredibly simple. Uh, and it just sort of depends on what you're trying to achieve. Right on. So right <clears throat> now we're seeing a problem with the SLP stuff, which is really unfortunate because it's awesome technology. Let me yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen there, Aaron. I think we can jump into the roundtable 
All right. Motion. Sounds good. Okay, there we go. All right, let me switch back to the main window here. And... All right. There we go. Now you got to come in as our little DJ. Yeah, let me... Let me pull myself in here. Uh, there I am. What's up, everybody? Transition. Uh, oh, there, there you are. Go. There you are. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sitting right under Stoyan's chin right now. So. Yes. No, I will. A mini me. Just to say. Yeah. To just make you massage my head. Mouse. <laughs> 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 no, I can't see. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just come up a little bit here. Okay. My boy. <laughs> yeah, bear, bear with our... Uh, there you go, that looks better. Yeah, everybody online, bear with our techno, technical hurdles here. We're learning the best way to do this sort of thing, so... All right. Um. So, yeah, SLP, I didn't know that uh, the databases, uh, the uh, explorers are not working as well anymore. That's... That's unfortunate. Yeah, um, you know, I think that this community, the PSF, we have a we have an opportunity to really step up in a big way. Uh, uh, for those who know my background, they know that I, I used to work at Bitcoin.com on the rest.bitcoin.com and developer.bitcoin.com platforms, and uh, and that's what originally started the full stack cash and that's i had a hand in the creation of the slp token protocol while i was there and uh they are starting to shut that platform down rest.bitcoin.com um and uh, they're forwarding people on to full stack cash so that's that's been a big driver in our growth recently and uh it does seem that they are struggling with the slp infrastructure uh with the block with the block explorer and at the same time, um, simple ledger, <laughs> simple ledger dot info. Yeah, no worries. Uh, at the same time, simple ledger dot info. I don't know why it's doing that. It's all good. The um, the the company who actually started the simple ledger protocol, like uh, you know James Kramer, uh, they're also starting to wind down some of their infrastructure. And they still have a really great block explorer at simpleledger.info, and it appears to be fully functional. And, uh, you know, it follows over occasionally, but so does the Bitcoin.com block explorer. And uh, I'm really proud of how reliable wallet.fullstack.cash has been operating. I think we've really nailed the, our ability to scale our infrastructure. Um, I'm, I'd love to see us 10x our API volume so that we could really put that to the test. I think we're ready to do that. But um, if we built a block explorer, uh, we could have you know that reliability that I think people would appreciate. And then we'd have to kind of think about well, how do we how do we monetize that so that it's not just a total loss leader? Uh, you know, one thought I had is we could we could sell advertising, and then that advertising money could go to burn tokens. That would be one really easy way. To monetize a block explorer, uh, so it's so the go the goal there is to provide reliable um, infrastructure for the community, but but we also need to find a way for it to pay for itself. Mm -hmm. So anybody that has any ideas, uh, we are all ears. If you want to reach out to us, uh, I mean it, it's not something where we could use the uh, token burn idea, but just less of a token in order to search, is it? I'd be, I don't, I don't really see how that, it would just be the, the people who would use the block explorer are definitely not always developers. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, developers would use it heavily, but they would probably be a small proportion. Yeah. Uh, so to, to, it, I don't think it would be appropriate to assume that a user of the block explorer would, would know how to like send a payment. Yeah. So when people are using the block explorers, uh, is it mainly to look up that transactions have happened and look at the genesis of the tokens, that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, as a developer, I use it heavily just to sort of analyze the transaction mm -hmm. and see if, you know, if it was valid or not. And yeah. then if it was valid, 
like, like in that transaction I was just showing a minute ago, uh, you know, that that provides a lot of information like, oh, there were three token UTXOs on the input and, you know, two on the output and like, you know, it, it, as a debugging tool. But I think that's probably the 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 minimum, like the not the, the most popular use of the block explorer would be just by normal people sort of looking to see if a transaction had confirmed and uh, and just you know just basic information like how how many tokens were involved uh, how much Bitcoin cash was involved uh, what were the inputs what were the outputs what were the transaction fees just all those all the details that anybody would want to look at um, when they're using you know it as money yeah it's uh, hot see Explorer is very cool too you can see like uh, for example you can see uh, your paper wallets there mm -hmm. how much token you have there you can see also, for example, uh, if you have uh, many uh, devices with different wallets, you can check them daily from one place without any time putting your mobile, you putting there your pin and everything. You just go to the link, bam, you can see your balance, everything. And yeah, like Chris mentioned, it's very useful to see if uh, some transaction is already like uh, go from your wallet to the blockchain. So do you have problems with your wallet software or it's like the receiver or somewhere? It's great to see the, how to see how the money going from one place to another. So yeah, yeah Explorer is very, let's see, I'm using it daily, like yeah. very frequently. I use it hourly. Yeah. Uh, the the other opportunity we have here is as we continue to explore cross blockchain uh, transactions, I and mean, we're already starting to invest in our own avalanche infrastructure. And as we uh, employ the the bridge more and more to transfer tokens across blockchains, that's a really unique use case that the block explorers that exist now will not be able to handle. Um, and so if we had our own block explorer, we could add those types of features to, to help, you know, the same sort of use cases of block explorers used today for debugging and just checking on things. We could actually track these cross blockchain transfers and, uh, and help people sort of de debug that whole use case. Now, let me ask this, where do the main costs come in maintaining this explorer if we were to uh set one up where would those be would it be in paying the developers to maintain it would it be in the hardware that we need to run it uh what does that look like i think the majority of the cost would be in the development and maintenance i think the there the the hardware infrastructure would be essentially a fixed cost it, it wouldn't be zero um yeah uh, you know but it'd probably be like less than a thousand dollars a month the, I, i'm assuming like if we had you know a million users let's say we had a, a million users a day uh our infrastructure cost would probably be less than a thousand dollars a month and uh but it would probably require a full-time developer just to just to get feedback, incorporate feedback, fix bugs. Um, so this that's sounds probably like, what it would take. This sounds like a great thing for that tier two of the development program we're talking about to handle, you know. Quite because, possible. Because that tier is supposed to be there for maintenance stuff. And so this could be a great opportunity to implement those people uh, as, as maintenance for that sort of thing and maybe uh, help to alleviate some of those costs in the long run. Yeah. 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 I don't know if, I don't think we want to do anything, you know, actionable right now, but I, I just kind of wanted to bring it up as something to think about. And I totally mm -hmm. agree with you that, that, that the, the, the right fit there might be with our, our new certification program. Yeah. So that's cool. Cool. I, I think we definitely need to look at that and uh, keep that in mind. Stoyan, you have any comments on that? Mm, yeah, it's good. Explorer is one of the Hutsi, very uh, needed tools. So, and uh, yeah, about the monetizations, it can be done more like uh, 
more like the wallet uh, full stack dot cache with more plugins. For example, you can have uh, plugins for parsing the op return data for different protocols. For example, mm -hmm. if you pay more, we will parse the memo dot cache op returns. So you can see the messages there, or we can parse this kind of op returns. So it can be more like with pluggable architecture. So we can charge more for the more feature. The basic mm -hmm. one is free, but if you want more, yeah, pay. Mm. Yeah, that, that's uh, doing a doing a tiered approach. That's a good idea. But I, I, I really like what you said about the processing the op returns. Um, the Bitcoin.com block explorer does that with uh, memo.cash transactions. Yeah. Uh, it'll it'll sort of take out the the low level stuff and just present it as a memo.cash you know tweet. And uh, uh, and then of course it does that with SLP tokens. It 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 automatically uh, decodes all the all the protocol level stuff and just displays the the nice token information. Um, and that's where I think we could really excel with our cross blockchain stuff because there's nothing like that on the Avalanche chain, but they do have a memo field. And uh, and so ideas like the Locat ID that exist in Bitcoin Cash, which is a really handy way to automatically detect uh you know different protocols using the op return or like your bcp js protocol uh you know it'd be really easy to incorporate that and and i like your idea of plugins if we built a basic like sort of just a bare bones block explorer uh and then took the same plugin approach uh we could just let anybody who cares about their protocol like okay yeah make a plugin give us a plugin and and uh, you know now all of a sudden your your protocol will automatically get decoded when someone looks at a transaction using your protocol. Yes, yes, it it will satisfy the people who are cared just about the payment. So they will just uh, see on the BCH transactions. They don't care about the SLP. Okay, mm -hmm. use this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, divine. I think we're that you guys are onto something with dividing things up and letting people do piecemeal. And I think we've used that analogy of we're going to make the French fries. Somebody else is going to make the milkshake. Somebody else is going to make the burger, you know, and being able to piece together mm -hmm. your meal. Uh, and I think that's really going to help because I, I see a huge use case for these tokens in like retail stores, right? Um, here's a way they can make and track discount tokens, right? And they can even do fun stuff where, um, they can like geodrop.cash and, or, um, I, I've thought of ways like I do 360 stuff. And so uh, you got a store tour, like, uh, I think stores are going to move to this more and I, I'm pushing stores this way where, uh, I, I go in and I photograph your store and then all the objects in the store can be clicked on, looked at in 360, and then you can put them in your, your basket. But how cool would it be to in that 360 environment, whether you're in a VR headset or you're on a desktop or a mobile, you click in a random spot and up pops discount tokens for the day. You know, and then they can set how many come from that particular token fountain. And then when you go to cash out or pay, those tokens would be factored into uh, how much you're paying. And whether you're paying fiat or I think it would be nice eventually to where, okay, I've got uh, wine tokens and it gives me a 10% discount. And that's factored in with the BCH or the or the eCash uh, for the total transaction, and then they they create a QR, and I send the money to them. Mm -hmm. It'd be really cool. But what what I'm saying about these guys is that's that's more low level stuff. They don't need to buy that higher level stuff. So being able to divide that up is going to help us hit a lot bigger market than if we just say. You know, it's free, or we got a or a huge cost use case. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, lots of food for thought here. Uh, we're we're getting a little late, uh, so we should wrap this up. But before we do, Stoyan, I wanted to get your thoughts on next steps for building a plugin uh, for NFTs uh, for wallet.fullstack.cash. Uh, you've you've given us some demos in the past. 
of your your BCP library and how it can can automatically like decode an NFT transaction and then display the media. Um, and I'd, I'd love to create a, uh, a bounty uh, for you to push forward with a, with a wallet plugin if, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, if I can share my, my screen and if we have 10 minutes, I can show you what I'm doing and what are my next steps. Yeah, yes. you should be able to share if Aaron can handle it. Yep, let me switch this over one second and then... Do you see this? And then uh, just make sure, Stoyan, that you let Aaron know before you stop sharing your screen. He has to do something on his end. Okay. Ah. That'll be cleaned uh, so up for next you... week. Okay. So uh, maybe if I can zoom a little... So I already started working on this stuff. Uh, so I make a very small wrapper around the BCH GS because like we told the previous time, it's good if we can do something with our current wallets, like this minimal wallet and the SOP client one, but they're very difficult to, to uh, extend because they're like, uh, they're made to be like, uh, get from the web you cannot import mm -hmm. them and extend them so i decided to do something with bchjs and i created a very simple wrapper so uh you can how to see uh import this library and it will mount uh, the the usual bchjs on on this uh, bch uh, namespace and you can like uh, alias it's like this one. So inside your rest oh, okay. of your code, you can use it the same like until now, mm -hmm. just like this one. But what is else doing this uh, simple wrapper? Uh, it's adding uh, one new uh, namespace NFT. So you can have uh, some like bchgs.nft uh, and some functions, some methods. And I already created uh, a method to, and I'm using this new course, utxo.get nice. to do the stuff. So I wanted to explore this one. So I already have uh, a create NFT group and I have a mint NFT group. I have a oh, wow. send NFT token. I have a uh, this one is my part of the create NFT child. So everything is already up wow. and running this is great and you just need I, a graphical interface uh yeah and i also tried to make it more simple to create uh, this kind of uh, nft transactions if you can see my usage of uh, this uh, uh transaction builder is a little uh, different yeah. so you just create array with outputs array with inputs you pass this to this construct x and it's creating the uh, the transaction so in that. this way I can, for example, pretty simple. Uh, it is pretty simple to add here one more like uh, output to be the BCP one. Mm -hmm. So because uh, before doing the graphical stuff, we don't have still an easy way to create this kind of uh, BCP uh, like based NFTs. So I wanted to do more first to have it like a common line interface. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, that's just it. You could take this library and plug it right into SLP Cli Wallet. Yeah. And yeah. that would let you get all the functionality working. Yeah. And then, and then Plus literally NFTs. the only thing to do is build a graphical interface at that point. Yeah. And about the graphical interface, I was uh, researching different stuff. And what was interesting, I found several projects which have an uh, interesting approach. They're creating something like a ready components, React components to show the the standard uh, NFTs like for it's for Ether, uh, for Ethereum so it's uh, this their idea about the NFTs this uh, mm -hmm. uh, 721 but uh, it's interesting to have a, a, a ready oh. a react component like i already done this for wow. my NFT checker so it's very easy to put it inside like like this one uh, 
like uh, like uh, just a second it's not the well but i mean if it's ready component you can just include it after this in the uh, in the plugin for the wallet.foo.stack cache or somewhere else mm -hmm. and it will show the nft so if it have uh, bcp it will show the media based on this bcp or it can directly get uh, the comp the URL from the document uh, URL, mm -hmm. or, but it will be the ready like uh, React component. So you just put it inside your JavaScript code and you're ready to go. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be a wonderful way to architect this would be build the build the React component, like you said, and then and then the the plugin would really just be plugin, a wrapper yeah, for, for, for for that because React it will component. have only the styling and stuff like this one, mm -hmm. but it will be more we can continue develop them independently. Like for example, right. this React component it will change time because we will have another standards and everything, but mm -hmm. the styling will be still here. We will have this uh, Gatsby component. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And below this, it can be some <clears throat> some wrapper like this one to make the the NFT functions. Mm -hmm. So this one can be pretty much given to different people to develop them. Like for example, good designers can do great job better than me in the like styling and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always been that's that was a big reason for doing the plugin centric architecture is just because I, I'm just, I just want to focus on base functionality and then I'll let somebody else worry about making it pretty. Yeah. That's a, that's a great approach. And so it seems to me like there's, there's really two plugins here. One is displaying the NFTs mm -hmm. and then one is creating the NFTs. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so two very different things, but it looks like you got them both covered here. Yeah. This one is maybe not part of the, of the, uh, that's the idea, but I mean, I, I in the moment cannot create NFTs with BCP easy. Mm -hmm, Until mm -hmm. now, I was doing some like crafts with uh, uh, this, uh, how to say, electron cache to mm -hmm. put this op return and stuff. But if we have an easy way to do this with uh, SOP client wallet, for example, the command line one, it mm -hmm. will be great. Just put there the like, I don't know, something and you have ready NFT. Yeah, I'd love to see a pull request yeah. to add some new commands to that for this. Uh, and on the topic of the way you're injecting BCHJS in this, mm -hmm. you're you're like so close to the way I'm doing it. With uh, if you look at uh, uh, BCH message lib, and I can send you links to this, and the BCH okay. encrypt lib, it does almost the same thing you're doing here, except it injects BCHJS as a dependency at runtime. And so that makes mm -hmm. the libraries like really small because yeah. they don't they don't have a redundant copy of BCHJS. They, they expect you to like inject BCHJS into them at mm -hmm. runtime. Okay. Um, yeah, and that I'll just keeps the library really small. Okay. This but uh, but you, I mean, you basically got the same idea here. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, I'm working on this already with or without bounty. <laughs> so well, that's great i love the initiative and, and i definitely cool. want to reward you in psf tokens if uh you know yeah like because you're doing great work here we're going to use it we're going to use it whether or not you want it but we're going to use it <laughs> it's for it's free software open source it's here so yeah everybody's cool. free to use it well um i need to put you in touch with uh andre cabrera who is uh he he, he helped me with the initial art architecture of our plugin uh for the wallet and uh he is i he was just mentioned the other day that he might be building a plugin for creating regular slp tokens and uh so there's definitely going to be some overlap there with uh with if we create a plugin for creating nft tokens so mm -hmm. we should definitely collaborate on that just so uh you know figure out <clears throat> uh, how to leverage one another's code uh i can I already stop this sharing or yep, you want you're... to see something else? Uh, if you want to share again, just I can transition yeah. back. There this, we go. This one is interesting. If you see interactive NFTs, this beyond NFT.io hmm. guys, they, they put in a code inside NFTs. It's a zip archive with uh, HTML, uh, CSS or, and some JavaScript. So when you purchase some NFT, you will have a program inside, which is interactive. 
like That's Hangman, cool. NFT That's cool. or something. Wow. That's, wow. This is great. I've been waiting to see an example of this. I've heard about this in theory, but I haven't actually seen it in practice. Yeah. I'm going to play with so. this because, uh, oh, it was the last meeting that we had. You were telling me about the the hackathon and all yeah, those, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and they were and they were talking about how you could embed NFTs within NFTs, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's and then and, and execute in like execute code payloads, and wow, so this is cool. This is heavy stuff. Cool. They, they, they have Very another cool. also interactive uh, NFTs where uh, like sound. The, the there was on Twitter. I will send you maybe link. But uh, in fact, you can send uh, the NFT parameters in real time. So it's again some program, but it has like an open uh, uh, a way to send them different parameters. So for example, it can ma- modulate from uh, your voice. Mm-hmm. It will show different like visualization based on the voice or the, the music or something, but it's NFT. Wow! So, so you could, so you could have like a program that just does a slight tweak to the audio, and then that would be an yeah, NFT. Yeah. Like you could sell that little that little software program as an NFT. I mean, it will react on the environment. So so mm-hmm. cool! It's NFT, immutable, but it still reacts to something, voice or I don't know light environments i don't know so it's great some wow. very very cool stuff is going in this area yeah yeah, yeah. this is cool i i love the hangman idea i can't wait to play with this <laughs> okay okay i will stop sharing uh is it okay all right oh okay. you're you're all good okay, so. we're back to our main screen now yeah oh, that's cool you never disappoint story and i i'm yeah. I, I appreciate all the bloodhounding that you do with these <laughs> NFT ideas. Cause I, no, I do not have the time yeah. to follow the space. And so I'm so happy to get the, your little brain dumps every couple of weeks. Yeah, it is really, really cool. So uh, oh, I'm excited. Some, uh, 3D, maybe Aaron also will be excited on this Beyonds. There was uh, some 3D camera yeah. NFT. So you can go inside and so oh, I think cool. you, uh, mm-hmm. you enjoy this stuff of, Hackery. <laughs> oh yeah, I I like the 360 stuff. It's it's challenging. It's not yeah. easy to edit. Uh, it takes a lot of computing power, but it's fun. When it's done, it's really cool. I, in fact, uh, I just did uh, was at the swimming pool on Sunday. I've got a waterproof case uh, right here, mm-hmm. and so I was. I took one of my 360 cameras underwater t- for a water test because uh, we got a big, huge zoo here with a cool aquarium and i'm trying to talk to them about letting me put the 360 camera in the aquarium with all the sharks and mm-hmm. filming down there so that you'll be able to put on a a headset and be swimming with the sharks hopefully so and then can make that into an nft yeah sell the experience yeah <laughs> yeah or tokenize it at least all right um yes. I do any of you have anything more to say? Cause we are hitting about a uh, hour and a half here and we should probably wrap for today. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Uh, really glad uh, that we got to cover everything that we covered. Um, and uh, yeah, I encourage anybody to reach out uh, on the PSF telegram channel. If you want more information about anything that we've covered here. And uh, yeah, check out psfoundation.cash, fullstack.cash, uh, chat.fullstack.cash if you want to play around with the pay to write stuff. And uh, yeah, yep, pointing right there. So over there. there yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's always reverse. It's always reverse. And uh, yeah, we'll be putting a, a bunch of stuff in the show notes today so you can check it out. If you have any questions, uh, please hit us up in the Telegram. And, uh, or we do take care of your pigeon. So you can hit us up that way as well. All right, everybody, we will see you next time with that. I'll see you guys later. And, uh, I'm going to hit the transition for the outro.